Welcome to a ChemCon interview on enforcement in a virtual setting but with the same ingredients. Knowledgeable experts, an interesting topic, and as always, a classic ChemCon cartoon sketching the context of the interview. As promised, we take a closer look at enforcement challenges in Europe in general and more specific at the European border. Papers, please. The recent results of a pilot project by ECAS Enforcement Forum on importers of products into the EU show that almost one in four products were not allowed into the European market. Where does this leave the European consumer? And what tools are provided to industry and inspectors to change this trend? We will discuss this with Sylvie Lumont, Executive Director, Product Stewardship at CEVIC, and Erin Anis, Head of Unit Support Enforcement at ECA. Sylvie, the recently published Chemical Strategy for Sustainability aims at a zero tolerance for non-compliance. Why is this so important for European industry? Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks for this uh, opportunity to, to present our views today uh, in coordination with, with Erwin. Uh, indeed, it's very timely because the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability was published today, well, on the day on the real recording, and we certainly uh, welcome the, uh, the measures to, um, to enhance and harmonize enforcement. Why is it important? Because we have lots of non-compliant articles on the market today. They are free riders, let's be clear, let's call a spade a spade. Um, and actually, we've, we've done an analysis of the data in the um, General Product Safety Directive, in the RAPEX data, which have shown that 92% of the non-compliances we've reached, which are reported on consumer articles under RAPEX, come from non-EU countries. So clearly, there's, um, there's a missed opportunity there's in, in terms of enforcement, but also in terms of safety. So it's um, so when when it comes to a major initiatives like the chemical strategy, yes, we do expect enforcement to come first and foremost as a measure or as a series of measures, and it starts with enforcing safety. Starts with enforcing existing measures. Um, we know that certain areas need being to be targeted as high risk, like online sales, imported articles, and that's in the chemical strategy. This is most welcome. We also see uh, proposals to use uh, new digital platforms, new new IT tools, to use the new market surveillance regulation for a more uniform approach to coordinate enforcers uh, around, uh, around the EU. So think, for example, um, you have 28 billion clothing items circulating today on the European market. And there's a new restriction on sensitizers in articles. I'm sure Erwin can, can discuss that much, much better than myself. Um, that, that restriction covers about 100 substances. So 100 substances, sensitizers, in 28 billion clothing items and 25 billion of those items are actually imported. How are we going to do that? Who's going to do that? In which countries? Do we have the methods to do that? Do we have the money to do that? Do you have the people to do that? So, um, and, the, and the strategy will introduce even more generic restrictions with many more substances in many more products. So it's absolutely essential um, that we step up enforcement, in particular on imported articles. And to put it shortly, no article should enter the EU if it does not comply with European rules. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Erwin, if we take a deeper dive into the main causes of non-compliance, how does this translate into upcoming priorities for the enforcement forum? Well, first of all, thanks for um, inviting ECA to participate in this very interesting discussion. And indeed, uh, on a very particular day when we can welcome the publication of the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability, where also the agency is happy to see that there is the necessary attention for enforcement into this document, which was already the case in the uh, strategy on the circular economy, which was clearly focusing on the difficulty of imported articles. It's very clear, we know, we have seen the results in this exercise, this pilot that we have been running. We are indeed also aware from the results from uh, RAPEX, but it's also necessary to put RAPEX into perspective. 
RAPEX is, as the Commission has been clearly mentioning in uh, the chemical strategy, uh, chemicals legislation except REACH, that RAPEX is good for what it has been designed for. It's indeed an alerting system for those articles which have a di direct impact on health and need a completely different uh, approach. Uh, there are other systems uh, in place for mentioning other uh, incompliances. And it will be indeed a, a part of discussion. If you look at what enforcement authorities are doing into the European Union, then we also have to accept that enforced or imported articles, although extremely important, is only a part of their total activity. They are involved with inspecting workplaces, they are looking at environmental permits, they are looking at safety data sheets, so it's only a fraction. I do indeed agree that what we find out is that the chance of finding non-compliancy looks to be clearly more in from the moment that we are looking at imported articles and that's why we have been doing this pilot project which was also a test in working together between reach enforcement authorities and the customs uh, because it's very clear that if you can stop the import this articles at the border of the European Union. It is a win-win situation for everyone. They are not entering, they are not coming in their in or warehouses, and we don't have to lose uh, and, and to dispatch all the different national enforcement authorities to go to do the inspections in all malls that we have and uh, storehouses, warehouses, uh, shops. So it's clearly something which could have an um, higher added value, creating and augmenting uh, the efficiency of enforcement. There are clearly a lot of uh, problems which are related to it, and Sylvie, thanks for mentioning that indeed cost price will play a role. Enforcement of imported articles means that we have to look at testing of these articles, and that's clearly some so has been in this report where the focus has been essentially on the import of cheap jewelry, jewelry for children, essentially looking at the presence of nickel, cadmium and lead, where we have indeed, let's say, a quick and dirty indication of which articles are probably not compliant. And this fraction can then be sent to an, an analytical lab in order to confirm whether yes or no, there are indications of uh, not being compliant. So clearly for the future, uh, there is a lot of additional work that we have to reflect on, on how we can organize this in the best way. And also how can we look and find the cheapest way of doing a quick and dirty analysis before sending to an official lab. Okay, thank you. I mean, uh, when I mentioned the pilot project, eh, I said one in four uh, products were non-compliant. Uh, if it's non-compliant, what happens to the non-compliant goods? Well, in this case, uh, we have uh, the figures into our report and more or less two-thirds of these products have been destroyed. Okay. Hey, if we talk about customs, uh, is it correct that there will be specific custom safari codes for SVHCs and restricted substances? Yes. Well, first of all, let me explain there. The, the pilot project was, in the vast majority of cases, um, coordination between reach enforcement authorities and customs. Simultaneously, the Commission has been uh, doing some additional activities together with DG Taxut, who has indeed been creating new tariff codes, 
uh, they are already published for substances of very high concern in articles and the Commission is working further on coming with a comparable exercise to look at restricted substances where we look at the reach restrictions under Annex 17 in all kinds of products and where we expect the publication uh, and the launching of uh, the stack codes for end of Q1 2021. Okay, Sylvie, the uh, SDS quality is in many cases quite low, often resulting in inaccurate information on safe handling and risk management measures. Is downstream user pressure a solution to resolve the quality of safety data sheets? The issue of safety data sheet uh, is is not new as such, and and it, it's 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 complex indeed, and we we've increased the complexity with um, with the extended part of the safety data sheet. At least in the EU, we've we, we've reached. Um, CEFIC has produced some material, including templates to help its members with, with the content of safety data sheets. So downstream users may have a role to play, but it comes primarily from the suppliers. Um, now, one area as, that clearly needs more attention is the exposure scenarios that have been uh, that are annexed to the safety data sheet according to the REACH requirements. And this is an area for improvement that has been identified in the REACH review uh, in, in 2018. Um, and we have a, a community of experts called the ENES community, um, which has been working on tools and methodologies towards improvement of exposure scenarios for, for a while. And they also worked on digitalization. Uh, at this point in time, after all this work, we believe that um, minimum requirements for exposure scenarios in the legal text in an annex to reach would actually help to harmonize the uh, the content of extended safety data sheets. So that can be one tool. We also need to digitalize supply chain communication. We need to find much more efficient ways. We need to explore new tools, um, but certainly this has been lacking uh, in the past and it has slowed, at, slowed down the process. Um, and both downstream users and suppliers need to continue to work together towards an, what do we call an IT standard, so a, a digital standard to allow communication in the supply chain. And now it's time to really bring it to life. So with, with clear requirements, with an IT standard, there's a higher chance that the quality, at least of the extended safety data sheets, uh, improves and meets and is consistent also with the what we call the main body of the safety data sheet. So the main part, the 16 sections, but in particular, the, the uses part. So yes, still some room uh, to uh, for, for improvement. Um, I hope that over time we will, we will go there. Okay, very good. Um, Sylvie, another question for you. Frequently, the exact ingredients of products are kept confidential by industry. Uh, they do this to, uh, to, to not give away all their secret recipes. And to bypass this challenge, industry sometimes reverts to absence declarations in their supply chain. Uh, also, more and more, for example, in the automotive industry, we see digital product passports. Will this help in creating a level playing field also in relation to enforcement of non-compliance? I think we first need to be very clear on who needs what information. And there are primarily two drivers for communicating ingredient information, safety and increasingly recyclability needs. And there will be more of that as we move down, as we move towards circular economy. So safety, for example, skin sensitizers in daily products, it's, it's, it's like allergens in food. It's very relevant and people should know where to find the information, perfumes, preservatives, etc., And that should be primarily on the labels. It can also be provided via QR codes and, and more information can be provi provided there. And for workers, the safety information goes primarily in the safety data sheets. And there's another level of information there in the safety data sheets, different requirements, different needs. Um, when it comes to circular economy, yes, indeed, um, there will be more recycling in the future. This, this means that the recycling operations need to be safe and the recycled raw materials, the secondary raw materials, need to be as safe as 
or, and of the same quality as the virgin materials, right? So to enable safe recycling and to enable um, safe recycled materials, recyclers and waste operators need information on the composition of the articles they very recycled. Right, so relying on the absence declarations is likely not going to be enough in the future. Um, in practice, what is important is to know which substances need to be declared for the purpose of safe recycling. Substances of very high concern, persistent organic pollutants, restricted substances, for example. But what is sufficient in one value chain may not be sufficient in another value chain, right? For example, the use of a substance may be restricted in toys, but actually that substance can be used maybe in building and construction. So an additional complexity is that we need the same level of information, ingredient composition information on imported articles, because we are not going to send back those imported articles in the future to their country of origin. We're gonna need more and more to recycle them in Europe. So there's a huge complexity to deal with, and this has indeed to be balanced against intellectual property. Because I don't necessarily want to give all the detailed composition of all my products to all my non-EU competitors who may be enjoying, uh, uh, you know, may, may come to the market as free riders uh, and, and maybe not be checked for, for compliance. So, um, so clearly, um, there's, I don't think there's a need to, to disclose necessarily the full composition. We need to identify what is relevant to be communicated. It has to be digital. It has to be adapted to the needs. And we need to explore the new digital technologies. We have a digital strategy for Europe now. Um, and the technologies have to be efficient, secure, and reliable for, comply, for supply, complex supply chain communication. And they have to protect confidential business information because there's also a set of law, EU law, that protects uh, you know, confidential business information. So all these challenges have to be looked at and overcome. We need to test new technologies. And this can only be done in cooperation with industry, but also the value chains, so that we progressively develop the solutions. But clearly, we need to find the right balance in an efficient way and um, maybe we would need one global standard, but we're not there yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Erwin, um, Sylvie Sketches said that digitalization can help achieving circular economy goals and increase chemical recycling. Do you expect more harmonized end of waste criteria for chemicals too? That's also an important uh, issue, but let me first come back indeed on uh, this uh, product passport, uh, which are also, as you mentioned, uh, Sylvie, to, uh, the digitalization of Europe and uh, the, the, an important part of uh, the Green Deal of the Commission von der Leinen. Um, it's very clear that this is probably still the most vague part that we've seen and in the circular economy strategy and in the uh, chemical strategy for sustainability. What is really meant, to what detail, to what extent can be linked by ongoing activities, because we should not forget that chemical industry is also paying a lot of attention to artificial intelligence. Um, and to what extent can this be linked to blockchain or not? So I think that's probably um, of both strategies, the part which needs the most discussion and interaction between authorities, industry, uh, to, to really see what's needed and what's technically possible. The harmonized uh, criteria for the end of waste is, of course, also something which is extremely important. As you know, the waste framework 
directive is a direct hands giving still uh, this as a responsibility for national authorities but if i compare the documents of the commission from 2015 and the documents that we saw this year you see that it's clearly mentioning that we have a problem that we have to look at the harmonization of this end of waste criteria and uh, uh, sir strategy clearly meant the commission out with a proposal on how to look at this uh, at national and or European level in 2021. So I think everyone is uh, clearly looking out for that. Uh, and once we are there, this can be linked with a second pillar of the circular economy, which is looking at harmonization between the waste classification and CLP classification. Okay. Um, despite many efforts to decrease inconsistency and enforcement at the border, many products enter the EU, for instance, as a small postal package without being checked. Often these packages bought via an online retailer do not comply with EU regulations. How can consumers and online retailers make sure that these products are from trustworthy suppliers without surprises? Well, first of all, um, check from whom who you are buying. Try to verify from which country it's coming from. Look at as far as possible compositions. It looks the labeling is the labeling looking correct? Is the information correct? And probably the most important is the price realistic or not? We have been and we are still working on it because Ref8 was falling in one way or another happily together with the COVID crisis and people obliged to work from home. Uh, the project that was done this year was on internet sales, which could be looked at indeed from home. So that's where we think we will not have major delays with the publication of it. The uh, inspections are continuing until the end of this year, and uh, we will come up with an um, a report in 2021 on the outcome of that but it's very clear that uh, everyone including enforcement authorities and even further pushed by what we have seen in a COVID-19 uh, situation that is that more and more people are starting to buy all kinds of chemical products, be it cosmetics, be it detergents, be it whatever, on internet. And we really have to look at how can this be enforced in the best way. So we want an industry view on the project was business to business. So the REF8 will be the first real project which is coming up with a kind of overview of what we see on internet sales okay so we want to add yeah i was, was going to to add a bit on of, on that because i completely agree that you know we've seen online sales grow considerably uh, recently in particular um and and i just wanted to give you a few examples of of what's going wrong there um we have a, we have a case of a, of a solvent gbl gamma butyrolactone which is actually a, a processing aid for industrial uses but it's also a narcotic substance it's a drug right um, and it's being sold on certain websites as a cleaner as a special cleaner and as erwin said if you look at the price it's a very very expensive cleaner i don't know who's going to buy that so clearly um, if you track small small signals like that and you could do that with it tools you may be able to spot um, some some illegal practices we have seen also ineffective disinfectants uh, being sold on internet you probably heard that uh, in spring at the and, and and still recently and you know of course unfortunately disin disinfectants have become uh, very popular these days another example is uh, we are facing illegal smuggling 
of HFCs, hydrofluorocarbon gases, as refrigerants. Up to one third of the allowed quotas in Europe are actually smuggled, and a lot of that goes via internet. And those HFCs have a, have a higher greenhouse gas potential than, than CO2, which is the reason why they are regulated under the Montreal Protocol and in Europe under the F gases regulation. This amount of illegal sales, via, mostly via internet, is equivalent to 25 million cars added to the European roads. It, it's worth checking, and we know, we know more or less precisely where this happens. We need the support of member states. We need the support of, for example, the anti-fraud uh, office, OLAF. Uh, we need to work together, and that's an example of where the private sector and the enforcement authorities can work together to try to track those illegal practices, because there are clearly direct safety threats to people, or environmental or safety threats, from um, which is a growing threat from online sales. And I don't think the consumers can find out by themselves only. They can be given tools, tips uh, for checking. But I think we also need a dialogue with the main e-commerce platforms to work together to try to better track those practices because it's, 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 it's not in their benefit either. Um, to be a vehicle for, for such practices. So yes, there's, a, there's room for exploring more uh, the solutions. And you know, with, with the REF exercise and, and working with the enforcement, enforcement Forum, there may be also some new ideas that emerge based on the, on the findings. So we, we very much welcome the, the work of the Enforcement Forum in that respect. Okay, great examples and suggestions. Um, final question for both of you. It's not only limited to the forum of enforcement, I think. We have to, how should I say, I think it requires an even broader discussion in the sense that, first of all, the forum of enforcement has a responsibility for REACH, CLP, biocides, pick and pop. Outside of that, it's in most majority of countries becoming difficult to do something. And that's where I think it's not that I want to turn my head away from it, far from that. The problem is there. But we have to look at how can we tackle this in the best way. And you're talking about smuggling. This is clearly a completely different activity of what we have in mind with classical enforcement of, of chemicals. So we we have to keep it in the spotlight. We have to discuss and discuss how we find the best ways to handle this. And I think it's also, it, it may also require a kind of reflection from chemical industry. And I know that many companies have been trying to do it because some of, some of these chemicals are not made in a bathroom. If they come from a chemical production, then we have to really also start thinking how is it possible that such kind of chemicals are ultimately arriving as products sold on internet. And then I think we can find a joint way of looking at it and the individual smuggling, which uh, we have seen examples on indeed this F gases. There you come into an extremely difficult situation and then you can also start thinking, are there ways to mobilize? Because this means that there are small or whatever enterprises which are knowing that they buy products which are illegally on the market, but which are cheaper and how we can map this and do something against it. Okay, thank you for broadening the horizon on this. And uh, Sylvie, thank you for the, the great examples to make this more tangible. Um, final question to both of you. What kind of enforcement tools and think big uh, and compliance tools should be developed and or made available for enforcement authorities? Sylvie. Okay. I think first, as, as, as Erwin explained, we need to pursue the collaboration between the different enforcement bodies at national and at EU level. 
um, customs and, um, and 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 product um, authorities typically to de and to de to, de to work together to design an enforcement strategy that applies to all the member states. We need to explore the new tools, the well, tools under the new market surveillance regulation. There's an opportunity for more harmonization, and some of that is in the new chemical strategy for sustainability. As I said, we need uh, strategic collaboration between the um, private sector and the law enforcement agencies so that we take targeted measures to react when we have an alert. Um, Whereas we can explore, you know, more, more efficient use or modernized IT tools to support enforcement. Erwin was referring to blockchain clearly, but blockchain solution for tracking. There's a tool for customs called the single window tool um, developed by, by the commission, I believe. So tools um, can, can support that. We need harmonized training programs for enforcers. And uh, the one thing I would stress, we should not forget enforceability. We cannot rely on paper declaration that does not contain sensitizers, that does not contain microplastics in the future. You know, no restriction should be adopted if the test methods for measuring compliance are not available. And we need to think of that where as soon as we, we adopt a restriction, because otherwise we're going to even broaden the gap with, with more generic, more broader restrictions in the future. Uh, there's a risk that we that it, it may be more difficult to um, to check compliance of products. So uh, we, we hope we will continue to have um, a dialogue with the enforcement forum, uh, when, certainly when it comes to reach CLP and, and their areas of uh, competency to um, look at how we can, uh, we can keep track of, uh, uh, of non-compliant products uh, to the benefit of the safety uh, for all of us. Okay, uh, Erwin, what is your vision on enforcement and compliance tools? I think we have a long-standing tradition on those issues that we have been enforcing for a long time, which is indeed reach and the workplace, uh, uh, environmental permits, uh, all kinds of things. We really have to look at what can we do in order to improve enforcement of what is coming into the European Union and essentially try to do this at the income of the union before it's entering because once it's in the european union we have a problem and you can find it everywhere this means that we have to look not only at the analytical techniques but also the cheaper methods of screening tests which give an indication on how to handle this, and uh, this may be a kind of yeah reflection that is also needed from the side of the Commission. How can this be more developed? And um, that will clearly help. We have to see, because in one of the interviews that has been given related to the customs project, the chair from Cyprus has been very nicely uh, and wisely saying that if we stop them at one border they probably go to another border and that's something that we have to avoid and where we really have to look at how we can come to more harmonization all over Europe and I have to still read in much more detail and looking out for further discussions and explanations from the Commission uh, but at least the, the topic is mentioned in the chemical strategy for sustainability in how to look at this and how to verify and how to push for a better and even better uh, harmonization of the enforcement also looking at we look at it financially because testing products which are entering the European Union costs money so we have to do it also in a cost efficient way and maybe uh, to close there are two both in the circular economy and in the chemical strategy, it's interesting to see the emphasis given by the Commission on globalization. Europe is not alone. 
we have um, legislation which is protecting us and if products are not healthy for Europeans or for the European environment they probably have the same problems for the non-Europeans and the non-European environment. Okay, I think a great conclusion. Um, Sylvie, thank you for your industry views on enforcement. And Erwin, thank you very much for sharing the results of many enforcement projects in Europe. I would say not only papers, please, but let's put the chemical strategy for sustainability in practice and carry out a zero tolerance for non-compliance.